Daniel Air 334 Old Concord Turnpike. Dan Manshrek, 353 Street and Pond Road. George Bailey, 19 Chesley Drive. Andrew Nett, 96 Lindsay Point Road. And uh, select person Sakosha sent me a note that he would be unavailable this evening. If everyone would join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm looking for our, a review of the agenda and approval as written or as amended. Select person there. I'd like to add um, appointments number D, Charlie Tate and Rick Okay. And Under six? Six, uh, six, six D. D. Charlie Dinkum. Oh. All right. I have a couple things, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Um, I'd like to add onto the consent agenda letter E, um, the road name of ST Circle for road accessing commercial industrial uh, garage and office space um, up at 220 uh, lot 54, 7.1 and 7.2. This is a development that was approved by the planning board a couple of years ago. Um, and in order to get addresses, the road needs road names and the, the road naming committee, P911 committee, uh, reviewed and approved SD Circle for the select board's consideration. So that would be consent agenda letter. E. Who's on that committee, please? Uh, the fire chief, the municipal office administrator, the highway support assistant, the town administrator. That's enough. Thank you. I see who's there. Uh, and I have uh, one other item, um, just a correction on the consent agenda, which is number five, letter B, little I. Uh, it reads September 13th, uh, and that date is actually September 23rd, those minutes that were previously approved. No objection. That's all I have. Thank you. Looking for a motion to approve the I'm agenda. I move we approve the agenda as amended. Seconded by select person air. Roll call vote. Air aye. Mandrick aye. Bailey aye. That aye. Thank you very much. Um, we have a public hearing for the acceptance of Breezy Way Road pursuant to RSA 674 uh, colon 40-A Roman numeral III. Select person Bailey. Thank you very much. Has Bracey Way Road, uh, has the name been before the committee for 9-11 uh, acceptance? Yes, it was previously named. Thank you. Bye. Select person there. Um, the last six or eight years, I've maintained that road for the developer and for the homeowners issue. So it is up to town standards. It's worth the two years. And... Um, I recommend it. I have no financial gain from it. I'm losing money. Mm -hmm. I'll make a motion to support it. I had one uh, note in the warranty deed that would be transferred to the town. There is a typo under item six on page two. It's um, Steve Lindsay uh, and not ANAD. Any amendments there too? I think it's supposed to say and any amendments there too. I think you're right. Thank you. Which I thought was interesting. I didn't know there were mineral rights over there off uh, that parcel of property. All the holes belt there. Hmm. Should we at least ask for a couple of comments? We would before we do uh, that. So. Um, any other corrections or items to be noted here? Just one. Uh, the, there was no punch list items from the engineer, but the road agent did ask that the road be sweeped and culverts cleared of leaves and debris uh, as a condition of the town's acceptance. Okay. Can I add something in there for uh, the next meeting under new business, or do I have to wait till I get there, sir? No, please wait till you get there. All right, Let's I'll focus do that. on the public hearing. Okay. 
Um, this point in time, I will uh, open the public hearing to public comment. You're participating virtually. This portion of the public hearing is specific to the acceptance of Breezy Way and the cul-de-sac as part of Village Place subdivision. Um, if you'd like to um, provide comment, you can raise your hand. Uh, if you're on your phone, you press star six to unmute yourself. Wait to be recognized by the chair and uh, proceed with your comment. I see nothing coming through on my end, Mr. Chair. Give it just a few more seconds. Be clear, anybody following the process, this the town accepting this road will mean that the town will not only own it, but also maintain it uh, through the winter months and as necessary. Seeing nothing coming through, at this time I'll close public comment. Select person there. Do you have something you like to add? I'd like to um, make a motion to accept with the conditions set by the agent. Second that motion. Roll call vote. Chair aye. Manchuk aye. Haley aye. Knapp aye. Okay. Um, right. Consent agenda. Move we accept the uh, consent agenda as amended. I'll second the motion. Here I. Mantra aye. Here we are. Nap aye. Um, it, this time, do you have something you, you said you had something you would like to add for the next meeting? Yes, yeah, and the new business for, um, for the uh, next meeting, I would like to add for uh, the board's consideration and discussion uh, to open the uh, town hall on Fridays from uh, 9 o'clock until 1 o'clock. To allow the uh, uh, individuals here in town to have uh, more access to uh, the town hall. That's only for discussion. Okay. So, the next, uh, an item for the next meeting for discussion. <clears throat> um, under appointments, we have the 2022 budget presentation for. The initial for executive admin personnel, government buildings, and miscellaneous. Yes, that is me. Welcome to the start of the 2022 budget process. <laughs> uh, so, the, obviously, for the board's benefit, um, you know, these presentations are just as much for the board as they are for the community. Uh, each department head will be uh, presenting before you uh, throughout this process, and I think it's a great opportunity. Um, for those points of discussion, uh, like I said, not only for the board, but also for the community. Um, and so we appreciate your uh, willingness to have uh, the time to talk about uh, the budget requests uh, for uh, the community to consider this coming March. So before I get into my presentation, I just want to discuss briefly the budget binder. So obviously all of you have a copy of the budget binder with the information um, compiled from myself and department heads. Uh, as the initial budget request, uh, this binder will be continuously updated throughout the process um, as numbers change, as the budget committee makes recommendations with the select group reports and otherwise. Um, also, uh, not only for the board's benefit, but for the community, um, this entire binder and all of its contents are available electronically on the town's website, barrington.nh.gov forward slash 2022 budget. So it's organized um, in a what we hope to be a very self-explanatory. So if you're looking for specific pieces of information, um, there's a table of contents at the top of that web page, um, and you can navigate directly to the section or specific document you're looking for. Um, and similarly, that will be uh, continuously updated. Um, real quick for the board, this binder is organized uh, almost exactly the same as last year. Um, I implemented some of the recommendations from the budget committee and the select board towards the end of last year's process. Um, the sections one or chapters one through 10 are all um, kind of background information. Um, sections 11 through 20 are all department uh, information, and those are in order of the presentations. 
Um, so we'll follow it kind of chronologically. Um, and then starting with section 22 down to 27, uh, those are largely empty right now, but we'll fill up through the process as the board make decisions. Um, the introduction has kind of the overall budget, um, there's a detailed table of contents there as well. Uh, the calendar important dates shows the all the dates of the budget process. The wage and benefit information is probably the most um, valuable for the um, uh, the background information, the benefit of the background information. Um, so everything about our wages and benefits is in there and makes a uh, helps give that uh, background narrative of uh, what the uh, what fed into the wage and benefit components of the budget. Um, the third page in that is a list of assumptions uh, because, of course, we don't know everything about our benefits and other laws going into the budget process. So these are the assumptions that were made and how those impact the budget requests. Um, next, we have the budget and expenditure history, followed by the revenue, which includes history, um, a full section on unassigned fund balance, which is valuable uh, to, to folks to learn more about um, that savings account. Treasury reports, capital reserve trust funds, uh, the Department of Revenue Administration forms for um, this year and last year for comparative purposes, uh, and the tax rate. Um, so, any questions about the budget binder before I proceed? Great. So, each week in your packet, uh, you, you will likely receive at least a couple of documents that are three hole punts. Um, you have two for this meeting. Um, each one of those documents is documents to be added to your budget binder. So if you have questions about where or why, just let me know um, for the, the process. That's what you can expect. Um, so we have uh, an 18 slide presentation for you, uh, which again, just as much for you as, as it is for um, the community and to have a brief introduction to the budget process here. Um, so this is a 2022 budget proposal. Um, Real quick, in Barrington, um, new demo, uh, demographic notes from the updated census uh, population of 9,326, which is an 8.7 percent increase. That's an average of gaining 75 percent, 75 residents a year for 10 years uh, since the 2010 census. Um, so if, if you didn't realize that we are growing, we are growing, um, and, and that has some important uh, implications on some aspects of this budget request to try to keep up or keep our services up with population growth. Um, the average household income is 116,000. Uh, we have a 3.5 percent poverty rate. Um, median age is 39.6, uh, which is young for our region uh, and the state. Um, and the rate of home, home ownership is 91.2 percent. So uh, I think the it's important that we all keep in mind who the residents of Barrington are when we're making decisions present them information, especially a budget. Uh, the highlights here is that we're growing um, and we, we have a you know largely a bedroom community um, that you know, travels for work and appreciates the rural character that Barrington has to offer um, and certainly a lower tax rate than most of our neighbors. Um, as it relates to the budget, the, there are a few revenue sources for the local government services that we provide. Uh, the one most everybody's familiar with is property tax. Um, important to note that that really only makes up 53% of the revenue that the town uses to operate. And so it's it's a uh, that is far from everything that, that we use. Uh, the next biggest category is vehicle registration. That represents 27%. Most folks uh, are familiar with that revenue source um, on the user end. Fees for service is 5%. And so that's things like the transfer station when you pay an ambulance bill, um, you, those those revenue sources, building permit um, uh, fees, et cetera. State and federal aid is also a portion, in our case, 8%. Um, so not insignificant, uh, but we collect most of our revenue locally. Um, and then there's miscellaneous sources uh, of 7%. And so it's important to know where we come up with the money in order to fund our services. Um, so of that 53%, uh, we raise that with a portion of the property tax rate. And so um, I'm very proud, and I know this board and boards before are very proud of the ability to maintain a stable municipal tax rate um, for what's going on 10 years now. And I expect that to continue with this year to 11. And 
That doesn't mean that the tax rate doesn't go up and taxes don't go up because there are other factors of the tax rate, um, the state education, local education, and the county. Um, but the select board, with department heads, and previous administrations have done what they can to keep the town side of the tax rate stable. So in 2020, the, the total town tax rate was 2277 per thousand of value. And of that, a uh, measly $3.69 is what goes to fund municipal services. Um, so that's all of your highway department, your police department, your fire department, your building office, tax collector, town clerk, everything. And so um, I, I personally am very proud of that. I'm proud of the department heads that helped um, make that work and, and use the um, funds that they have available in such an efficient way to provide excellent services at a low cost to residents. And so the, uh, you'll see a couple of adjustments um, to the assessment. So you'll see those in those years that the assessment rose and average of 8.4% and average of 12.5%, the town side of the tax rate dropped that proportional amount. And so we'll see that again in 2021, uh, the assessment will rise about 20% um, and we'll see the town side of the tax rate drop 20%. Um, and so we'll be right around $3 a thousand uh, for the municipal tax rate, uh, which again is just remarkable considering the variety of services we provide. Uh, measures of financial stability. I'm glad to report that uh, Barrington is um, is very financially stable by most measures. Um, a big part of that is a stable tax rate, which we just talked about. Um, so there's limited budgetary tax impacts for those 10 years. Um, and and we, that doesn't mean our budget hasn't increased, but it's been covered by an expanded tax rate, which has been a goal of the select board and commission um, for many years. Um, additionally, our unassigned fund balance is in a <coughs> healthy position at 12.4%. Um, the DRA recommends a range of 8 to 17 percent. The select board's policy is to target the midpoint at 12.5 percent. Um, and so we are right there at 12.4 percent. This is really important for cash flow um, and maintaining um, a reserve in case of emergencies. This is um, the unassigned fund balance is also as it grows. It's an opportunity for um, the town to consider making capital investments. Which is, is frequently what the select board asks voters to consider. Uh, unassigned fund balance, you know, talking about that capital use, um, the, the history going back to 2014, what the balance has been, and what we've been able to invest in the community um, at town meetings. So last year it was 538,000, the year before 700,000, year before that 1.3 million. Um, and you can see those very important investments. And the important thing to note here, is this is these is investments that we've made in the community without having to raise property taxes. Yes, a portion of that surplus that's in unassigned fund balance comes from property taxes that were previously raised, um, but this is how the, the select board uh, the select boards previously have chose to invest that in the community. I think select person there has a question. I'll come it up. OK, keep going then. Um, oh. Real quick, post 2021. Oh, yes, that should be 2022. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I would like very much to move on to 2022. Um, 2021 has been OK, but um, I look forward to Barrington's tricentennial in 2022 um, and raising a heck of a lot of money to make the best ever. Uh, OK, so the approved 2021 budget, you'll remember this was a budget reduction from 2020. Um, of about 30,000. So 2021 budget seven million two hundred seventy two thousand four hundred fifty three dollars. The proposed 2022 budget, thank you, some person there. Um, at this stage of the process, at 7.7 .7 million. Uh, that's an addition of almost 500,000 or 6.78 percent. Um, and I think uh, uh, again, a couple of important notes about at a high level, um, keeping in mind that Barrington's population has grown and continues to grow. Also an important factor that um, I think is um, catching up with Barrington's budget specifically um, is the rate of inflation. So, you know, the uh, it Barrington's budget has typically not grown with the rate of inflation previously. Um, and at, at times that, uh, you know, allows that makes the dollars that we have to spend worth less than they were um, previously. And so, um, the 6.78 is a is a big number to start off the process with, uh, but I think it's important to keep in mind that we're proposing a budget to the select board and community um, to, to continue to providing the services and the level of service necessary 
Um, and, and so we're really asking you to seriously consider what we're offering um, with that in mind that, that we don't take a budget requests like this lightly. Um, to that, I want to talk briefly about the primary budget impact factors. So uh, the pie graph on the right, you'll see that these five categories represent over 75% of the budget increase. So of, of the entire 6.7%, the vast majority is right here. Um, most of these you've already heard about, which is um, you know the, the point of bringing it up to you outside of the budget process so you can start to think about these things, ask questions, et cetera. Um, the first is the fire department staffing changes. Um, so for 172,000, uh, we're proposing to add two full-time firefighter EMTs um, to adjust the hours of the current full-time employees and add one 12-hour per diem shift um, in order to make a 24-hour schedule <coughs> with the four full-time employees. Um, so we've obviously talked about that. You'll hear a lot more about that, uh, but that's the impact on the proposed budget. Highway department staffing changes. So earlier this year, um, we asked the select board to consider creating a working foreman position in the highway department um, to fill a need in, in that department, uh, both from a manpower standpoint and a supervision standpoint. Um, that's been a very successful adjustment that we've made. Um, and you know, we knew when we made that decision that it would have implications for the 2022 budget. Um, so that adds $87,955 to the 2022 budget request. Select person there. Well, I have a question. That position was there, but wasn't budgeted. But it was a line item. And then um, we had a gentleman uh, retire. So why is there such an increase when the person who retires should offset it? I would think we didn't have anybody retire. You're thinking two years ago. Two years. Two years. He was replaced. This was a new position that the select board created. You remember part of the conversation was that because of a staff vacancy, an extended staff vacancy, we had budget funds available. Um, where we didn't need to come up with money in order to add this position in 2021. But we discussed the 2022 budget impact. Um, um, uh, I might want to bring this up at a later date. Um, the highway department budgets later in the process. Yeah, I, I have a question on the later date problem. Okay. Um, so the next category is the police department staffing changes. Um, the request is to add one full time officer. Uh, which is starting in April, so 75% of the year, and that uh, impact on the 2022 budget is $67,000. Um, election staffing changes, so in 2021, we only had one election. Uh, the town election in 2022, we'll have three elections, the town election, the state primary, and the state general election. Um, so those um, wages are necessary in order to staff those elections. Um, and finally, the library is proposing some staffing changes. Um, that add twelve thousand seven hundred twenty-six dollars to the budget. Um, that's increasing the hours for two employees, um, and one of the for one of the employees, the increase in hours uh, makes that position benefits eligible. So that is the vast majority of the uh, proposed increase um, from those categories. Um, really importantly, want to touch briefly on uh, the revenue impact. So again, you'll remember from the uh, process uh, in a few slides ago, we talked about how only 50% of the revenue that we collect in, uh, or the revenue uh, that the town uses to fund its services comes from property taxes. So that other 47% is really important to pay attention to and has just as big an impact on the tax rate as does the expenditures and the budgeted expenditures. So we, I'm glad to report that we have some favorable information from the state. So for 2022, our rooms and meals tax is estimated to increase 30% or 160,000. And so what that means is dollar for dollar, the first $160,000 increase in the operating budget uh, will be, uh, will be um, offset by this increased uh, state revenue source. And so that's a positive thing. That doesn't mean that you know that's how it has to work, but we have more revenue coming in, which helps make our decision easier if the goal is to keep the town side of tax rate stable. Um, highway block grants expected to remain stable at 220,000. Building permit revenue, you'll remember that we adjusted the building permit fee schedule to start in January of this year. Um, that coupled with uh, a real big boom in uh, building permit applications, um, we've seen uh, that revenue increase by 90% from uh, up 90,000 to 190,000. 
And so again, that's that's revenue that we don't have to raise by property taxes, um, which is which is important to balance uh, the uh, revenue that we're collecting from residents. Um, and so by statute, that should cover uh, the cost of the budget. Um, and so we're pretty close to that with 190,000. The total budget is 227,000. It's important to note that we are also fund some assessing functions out of that department budget. So we're probably about about right about where we need to be. Uh, finally, the transfer station revenue is projected to increase. Um, and the reason I, I make mention of this is because you'll see operating budget increase requests in the transfer station. But it's very important that we keep in mind that those are directly offset by revenue. And, and we uh, budget for that revenue, that increased revenue as well. Uh, so we still have to raise and appropriate the funds, uh, but it's offset um, on the revenue side. Um, so Question. If yes, sir. If you'll go back, please. On there, on the first part, you notice that state meal and room tax, you started off with it at 160,000. What's the possibility of it extending out further? So that's a good question and it's very political. Um, I wish that I could um, anticipate better what that's going to look like. The governor has made a commitment to increasing the appropriations to communities and the meals and rooms tax is one of the tools that he's chosen to do that. So that's why we're seeing a 30% increase, that additional $160,000. The trouble is he's also made a commitment to businesses to help them as much as he can. So part of that is a um, a reduction in the meals and rooms tax rate from 9% to 8.5 or 8, don't quote me on that. Uh, so that will impact the future uh, funds available in the meals and rooms tax, but this is great progress. So I don't know where we're headed, um, but I have confidence that, that the state isn't going to balance their budget meals and rooms tax based on um, what the governor has expressed a commitment to. So he's giving himself an out. Okay, thank you. Slide person there? Next slide. Okay. Can I start? Um, the two. Um, 2022. Oh, thank you. And then Eagle Eyes over here. I thought um, we did 1.3 across 11. For a number for now. Yep. So we'll touch on that. So um, the some general budget information that well. So yeah, we'll in time. In time, we'll get there. So the uh, the budget request as presented to you includes a step for eligible employees, a 2.5% cost of living adjustment, no top of scale bonus, and for benefits on the insurance side, um, I started out estimating a 10% rate increase. And so we'll have additional information in October um, that will refine those um, insurance cost increased estimates as it relates to cost of living. So Last year, what the board asked me to do is propose a methodology that allows the select board to consider, irrespective of what the numbers are, what the data points were to, to assign a cost of living adjustment. And so um, earlier, late spring, early summer, I proposed that methodology. The select board asked for some additional information. We reduced, reduced, uh, reviewed that additional information, and the select board chose to uh, identify as the piece of information to rely on for a cost of living, the social security adjustment, the social security cost of living adjustment. For at that time period, the social security cost of living adjustment was 1.3%, but the social security um, adjustment that would be used for the budget process would be the one that's released in October, which hasn't been released yet. But uh, that number, the 2021 social security cost of living increase is expected to be 6% or more. It's going to be the biggest in, in a decade or two. Um, there were some bigger jumps um, years ago. And so I, um, I know that's the number that the, or that's the data source that the select board committed to, um, but I, I don't, um, based on the budget that I want to present to the select board, um, I didn't choose to propose a 6% cost of living adjustment. 2.5% um, is in line with what my initial proposed methodology um, uses. And so that uses three data points uh, instead of just one, which helps normalize that increase over a longer time period and, and more specific, uh, because that's the trouble when you choose just one data point. Um, you're susceptible to spikes and valleys, and it's, um, I don't think that's a great way to budget. 
Um, and so I've chosen to propose as a starting point 2.5% cost of living adjustment. Included in your budget packet in section three um, is the, the language of the proposed cost of living adjustment methodology and also a, uh, so it's five or six pages in, and also an updated um, set of data for following that methodology. So after I finalized the budget, um, but when I was preparing the binders, the next round of data was released. And so um, while it was at 2.5% when we were first looking at this, um, the, the average uh, based on the methodology is between 3.28% and 3.63% now. And that average will only increase further once the Social Security cost of living adjustment is released. And so. I will stress what I explained when we were previously reviewing the methodology that these are not numbers we can ignore. Um, this is we're looking at a variety of uh, data points that reflect inflation. Um, and if we continue to ignore inflation and the reduction of the value of the dollar as it relates to our wages, then we're going to end up in a similar situation like we were a couple of years ago where we had to bring our make sweeping changes to our pay plan to keep it competitive with the labor market. So I think 2.5% is a great place to start. And it's a, it, it, I know that it will be a topic of discussion uh, further in the budget process. Um, so unless the board wants to talk about more now, I'll move on. Keep going. No, I got a question. Yep. My understanding was you, you want to put it in my screen where you read the number in the books and <clears throat> adjust it later on as right. through the budget. But Connor is proposing his budget right now, and he can propose anything he wants All right. at this point because it's not set in stone at this point okay. it, as it stands. Right. Uh, and not to speak for the uh, budget committee chair, but um, one thing that the budget committee reiterated at their last meeting uh, <laughs> was that it's, it's their opinion that it's better for the process that the select board make a decision on step allowance and cost of living adjustment. Um, as early in the process as makes sense um, so that we don't get to the end of the budget process um, and and move the, the numbers up or down large pieces. So, okay, thank you. Moving on. Um, so for individual budget lines that have increased $10,000 or more, mm -hmm. um, so this excludes wages and benefits, which we uh, just touched on, uh, just a couple of categories, election wages, which is, is kind of a wage line, um, but we already touched about that elections instead of one admin contracts this is an important one um, it's a rather large increase at twenty five thousand uh, dollars but it's really important and this is all information that the select board uh, has previously been presented with so we had a cyber <coughs> audit earlier this year we've worked diligently with the technology committee to prioritize and identify um, those cybersecurity uh, protections that we needed to implement that cost money uh, but to better protect the town and so uh, it does add a cost to the budget, uh, but I would argue that this is critically important um, and it's all been uh, very, very much supported by the technology committee um, and embedded through quite a long process. And some of you folks may remember Peterborough got hit for two million, two million. and the rest of the country. Small uh, towns, big and large throughout the country are being attacked the same way. I have a question. Will you say for uh, improvement of cybersecurity, et cetera, does that include uh, coming online with a new town hall? Any cost of any of this cost here be related to it? No. Thank you. No, this is uh, mostly stuff that we've already implemented. Um, you'll remember uh, I asked the select board with the support of the technology committee to use some um, incident fund monies uh, earlier this year to fund not only the cybersecurity audit, but also. Um, implementations of some of the recommendations. Uh, so now budget decreases. So these are individual budget lines that have decreased ten thousand dollars or more. Uh, evaluation contracts uh, dropped ten thousand dollars. So uh, you remember we added uh, fourteen thousand dollars in, or no, twelve thousand dollars in last year for uh, the partial statistical update, which was performed this year. We won't need to do that next year. We're just going to go back to our six evaluations. So that budget's reduced. Uh, the general government building's lease line is down 14,000. I'm going to move into the new town hall in 2022. 
Ambulance contracts is down 15,000. Uh, this is based on reduced intercepts. You remember the uh, fire chief raised this line in, in for the 2021 budget uh, based on some uncertainty about exactly um, how some of the changes that were happening in the mutual aid environment would impact us. So we're honed in a little bit better on where we should be. Uh, recycling cost is reduced $10,000. And that's based on uh, 2021 utilization and recycled materials value. Glad to report that we're finally starting to see the recycling market turn around a little bit. Uh, we've actually gotten a couple of checks recently for recycled materials out of the single stream recycling. Um, so that reduce our, reduces our costs as well on the other side. Additional budget decreases, um, winter contract, uh, winter contractors is down 33,000 to 100,000 uh, based on uh, last year's utilization and um, expected future utilization. Um, salt and sand is down 32,000 based on improved management and salt and sand utilization. Uh, transfer station wages and benefits. Um, this is the uh, adjustment from full time to part time for that lead attendant. Uh, requested warrant articles. So, this I know will be a talking point throughout the budget process, uh, and we're starting with a pretty lofty request, which um, I believe we will have to work diligently to prioritize and reduce because I don't think we have enough unassigned fund balance to fund all of these fully. So we have um, many reoccurring um, capital reserve requests from unassigned fund balance. We have a couple new ones and a couple of increases. And uh, each one of these will be presented with each department's budget. Um, but the, like I you know, talked about earlier with unassigned fund balance, we're at 12.4% right now. Um, if based on what I estimate we have, we're adding in, which is all in the unassigned fund balance chapter in the budget binder. Based on what I think we're adding in, this would bring us down to the mid 11% range of the, for unassigned fund balance, um, which we've been before and, and wouldn't be um, dramatic to recover from. Uh, but I think we need to uh, think critically if we want to, if each one of these is a high enough priority this year to bring that account balance that low. Um, so the alternatives would be to um, fund some of these uh, proposed uh, warrant articles from the tax rate instead of the um, unassigned fund balance, uh, but that forces the select board to think critically about um, how they're prioritizing warrant articles, uh, because I think uh, the way that that has happened sometimes in the past um, hasn't uh, hasn't reflected positively on the process. So um, just a Quick slide to show you where we're starting from, but like I said, there will be much more conversation about that. The person there. The paving line. Was that was that usually in this right? The warrant articles, additional. A few years ago, there was um, we were consistently asking for a hundred thousand dollars from unassigned fund balance into a non-lapsing account, um, and the last two years we used the transportation fee capital reserve to serve that same purpose. So. My question is, underfunded. Uh, are we still carrying the six hundred thousand for paving? Yes. So we're underfunded and stuff. That line item. That that's really something we should get to in the highway budget. All right. Well, it usually wasn't here, but now it's out of this for good. Warrant articles. So it's not being proposed. We're not proposing a warrant article. We would propose um, utilizing the transportation fee capital reserve again. Um, that worked well for us this year, uh, but certainly we can discuss that further during the highway department's budget. So again, um, just back to the purpose of using fund balance for these capital projects, it's responsible investment in the capital projects, which helps reduce the tax impact. Um, while it is taxes previously raised um, or other revenue sources, um, it's it doesn't impact the, the future tax rate, which is important. Um, the uh, it's unexpended appropriations um, based on taxes raised or on anticipated revenue, the revenue in excess of projections. Um, and like I said, it's uh, the fund balances, the savings account uh, help ensure cash flow in case of emergency. So that's kind of like the overall budget. Just a couple of quick notes on the budgets that I'm responsible for, which is found in <coughs> chapter 11. Um, the incident fund as a placeholder, I put 50,000 in there. That's right about where we are this year um, for the budget. Um, and we'll move that number throughout the process. Um, I think 50,000 is, is a decent target. A couple of years ago, it was 100,000, which I think is, is too high for that purpose. Um, but that's subject to change. Admin contracts, we already talked about. 
Um, for general government buildings, um, on the communication side, you'll see an increase. Part of this is also from um, the cybersecurity audit and other IT improvements. We've increased the redundancy of our internet service provider um, for uh, both the town hall facility, public safety building, and the recreation side of the rec library. Uh, and so that has a cost. It's, it's important, it's critical, uh, but you'll see cost increases as a result of that. Uh, the general assistance wages um, at, through attrition, um, I consolidated the welfare caseworker and human resources administrator position. Uh, so you'll see a reduction in wages and benefits for uh, in general assistance uh, because that was a position that was not filled, um, an FTE reduction. Uh, and so now happy to answer uh, any additional questions. Again, I'm plugging the budget binder, uh, which all the credit in the world to Tiffany for organizing um, and future credit for keeping up to date. That's at barrington.nh.gov forward slash 2022 budget. Um, it's, it's this entire binder, hundreds of pages of, of content for your research and pleasure. Um, and if uh, outside of board members, if there's any community members that have questions about the budget, the process, anything included in here, uh, feel free to reach out to me directly uh, with the contact information. Great. Uh, does the advisory budget committee have anything they would like to comment on with regard to um, the budget overview as Connor presented. Just recognizing that, that many of the uh, issues and increases will be discussed with each department head as those time up come up. The one thing that uh, Connor did did not mention in this is that there's twenty five thousand dollars in the long term bond interest. That was this also in the 21 budget not spent and what are the assumptions in that i think that's a bit to into the discussion and otherwise i appreciate uh your diligence in this budget preparation so i'll hit on that point that he raised about the um, there is a we are carrying a twenty five thousand dollar request um, for from last year for uh, bond interest so this would be what we would use to fund if we borrowed the $875,000 for the town hall project. So if the uh, funds through Congressman Pappas's office, the direct federal funding of $1.5 million comes through, it's likely that we wouldn't need to borrow all or any of that bond, uh, which would be tremendous for the community. Um, given that that isn't finalized yet, hopefully it will be before this budget process is concluded. Um, I've conservatively budgeted that. Uh, um, uh, for that interest repayment um, pending additional information otherwise. Um, I think it would be premature to take it out now and be counting our, our chickens before they hatch. Um, but to uh, Mr. Saunders' point about the budget committee, um, like I mentioned earlier, you have a copy of their, their minutes in your printed materials. They had some questions, which um, I won't um, uh, answer them all in public right now, but the answers are in my town administrative report. Um, to the information that they requested. There's also an updated document um, for your budget binder, um, which addresses a couple of their questions as well. Um, and so that. Any questions from the board that they would like to raise at this point or wait until we get into the actual budgets? Um, the next item on the agenda is the Stratford Regional Planning Commission reappointment for Mr. Steve Diamond. Uh, it was <clears throat> discussed at the planning board meeting uh, last Tuesday, and the planning board agreed with the recommendation to reappoint him to the Stratford Regional Planning Commission. Um, they were also looking to see if there was any interest in anyone else filling the other available seat for the Stratford Region Planning Commission, to which um, I don't know of anybody that stepped up to take advantage of that. Is it too early? Oh, to raise hand. No, you go ahead. I'd like to make a motion that uh, we appoint uh, Mr. Steve Diamond to yeah. the uh, regional uh, Stratford Regional Planning Commission. Second. Air aye. And Jerry Guy. Bailey aye. Now, did you raise your hand to join too? Now, if I, that's what I saw. I, I didn't see that at all. 
No, no, there's no specs so, on there, so I'm all so right. So a, a motion for George to be the uh, other Decline person on that the, motion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we talk about a hang uh, second. Um, the next item on here is uh, Gary Imbri for the Conservation Commission alternate. This is just here for discussion, but it is supported by the conservation commission. Um, we're going for appointment tonight. Um, I haven't seen the paperwork no, yet. This one was just, just review. Well, the, the, this is the paperwork's in the packet. Right. Um, this is per the town's appointment to board. <coughs> um, this is uh, the select board's ask to consider for discussion at the first meeting and for a vote at the second meeting. Uh, Mr. Embry has previously been involved. He's on a local river advisory committee. Um, and so similar to how the board did with Jack Gale, you could waive the appointment to board procedure and make the decision tonight if you'd like to, um, given that you have previous experience with Mr. Embry. Uh, but it's uh, it's up to the board. If you wanted to appoint him tonight, I'd recommend waiving the procedure. Select person there and then select person Bailey. Um, yes, um, he, he attended the uh, last meeting. The conservation is up, and he's a um, good candidate. He has the time and the willingness to put into it. And today he was gathering information on the bylaws, so he knows where he stands and stuff on doing water easements and checking all the um, doing his diligence as a person should do before he uh, dives into it. So he's hard at work already as a citizen. So I wish you recognize him and appoint him tonight. Thank you. Select person Bailey. Yes, as uh, just a reminder to everybody, I know that uh, uh, several meetings ago we turned around and uh, uh, approved the new guidelines for appointment to uh, committees and what have you. Does this fall in line with this at all, Connor? It would be if we waived it. If we waived it, yes, but not right now. It doesn't fall in place if we didn't waive it. Right. This is okay. This no, is. Sorry. This is currently in alignment with the guidelines. If we wanted to make a motion to approve him, we would waive the guidelines since it, with the assumption that uh, everybody is satisfied with the data they have and the feedback that we've received from the committees. Thank you. So what person I I'll make the motion to waive the uh, procedure and point Gary to the uh, conservation committee as an alternate. As an alternate, I have a second. Are there any objections to that? Hearing none, I will. Um, I'm okay with the uh, roll call vote on waiving the procedure. Air I. That's right, Bob. Nap I. Now, somebody want to make a motion to approve him to the. I'll do it. I'll to the, as an alternate to the Conservation Commission? Yes, yeah. Air and second in by Manshrek, select person Manshrek, roll call vote. Air aye. Manshrek aye. Bailey aye. Nap aye. Select person air. Um, the floor is yours for item D, Mr. Tatum. Yes. For uh, recognition and to not, not waiver for discussion for a future when all the information is provided to the vote, I'm not asking for a waive. So we haven't received an application, so we couldn't waive that one. So, um, but I'd like to take this time to recognize Charlie Tanzan, all his work he's done over the years, 15 plus years on the Trails Committee. And the Barrington Conservation Committee has recognized that and they would want to make, they want to make him an alternate pending paperwork. So this is his time for a show of recognition of him and the board's support of him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tatum, for all the work. And he's in support of uh, the idea of being added to the from the as an alternate. Great. Um, at this time, I will open the first of two public comments. If you're participating virtually, you'd like to wager a public comment, please raise your hand, enter a chat comment. Um, or if you're participating on your phone, you can press star six to unmute yourself. Uh, wait to be recognized by the chair. Certainly, anybody in person is welcome to offer public comment as well. Uh, 
Yeah. Give it a little bit more time. Please. Just shoot him. It's okay. <laughs> Why we have space here? <laughs> <laughs> Still nothing on Ryan. All right. At this time, I will uh, close public comment. Staff reports. Thank you. So, uh, just two quick items. Uh, September work anniversaries. I read through at the um, uh, first meeting in September, the September 13th meeting. Uh, so, I still extend my appreciation to those employees for their tenure. Uh, the second item, which I thought was pretty interesting, um, this the uh, course of the Naval Shipyard has a Seacoast Shipyard Association, um, and they sent out a flyer uh, to communities, including Barrington. Uh, but I wanted to share the information because I found it interesting. Thought you might as well. Uh, so Barrington has, uh, from their data, 162 employees that are employed by the Ports of Naval Shipyard, um, with a total of 12.6 million dollars in payroll, uh, and that ranks Barrington as the sixth highest number. Uh, the community with the sixth highest number of employees of all New Hampshire municipalities uh, for course of Naval Shipyard. Uh, so certainly only a fraction of our um, nearly 9,500 residents, but um, I thought that was uh, information worth sharing. That's all I have. Thank you. Very good. <clears throat> Municipal Office Administrator Cottle. Aye. <coughs> old, um, old business, I don't see anything carrying over under old business. Moving on to new business, um, the police union donation of the canine, and I'm assuming you'd like Officer Joy to come up and speak to this. The chief himself. Uh, and so uh, as he gets set up there with the municipal office administrator, the request for the select board tonight. Who better than the former is true. canine officer and one of the most recognized in the state of New Hampshire? Thank you kindly. Um, so the specific request for the select board to consider tonight is donating up to $9,500 from the local police union, the NEPBA Local 240, um, for the purpose of purchasing and potentially training a new police canine. So I don't have a long presentation for this. I don't think it needed. You're welcome. Um, I brought Officer Morris with me. Officer Morris is your next handler. Um, basically, the only reason I'm here is if you have a union that cares enough about the canine program that they went out on their own because they realized that the budget won't support the purchase of a new dog. So they went out on their own and they did this to support the program, to support the police department, to support Officer Morris, quite frankly. Um, so the, the short ask is we're asking for you gentlemen to accept the donation so we can go forward and get an appropriate dog for the program. Select person Bailey, select person Air. What is the cost of an, of an appropriate animal? So that's a hard question to answer, Mr. Bailey. That's why we use the 9,500 number. The dog we're going to be looking at at the end of this week, eight thousand to eighty-five hundred dollars. Thank you. Uh, Seventeen-month-old male Malinois, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, decent amount of training into it, so it's not green. Uh, a green dog, we're looking in excess of fifty-five, six thousand dollars ish. So we're we're going to jump the learning curve a little bit here, hopefully. And and from I'm assuming at that end, if you spend fifty-five to six thousand. It may not get you where you want to go in the training aspect. There, there's the there's the gamble um, for a green dog. Generally, as long as it's in the 16, 17, 18 month range, we can test for drive. It should get us where we need to go. It's just going to take us a lot longer to get there. Um, but if I have a dog that's already got some training in it, I can see where it stands in certain areas and we jump that gun. Uh, for instance, I already know this dog has some apprehension work into it, some scent work into it. I've seen its hunt drive already in video, so I already know that I'm starting up here versus down here. Um, you know, I didn't see obedience, but that one started obedience, if I'm not mistaken. He'd already worked obedience. Um, the, the individual that we're going to be testing this dog is, is a current canine handler, so he knows what we're looking for. He knows what we're doing. He's not a mass vendor. He's not importing a ton of dogs at once. He raises one and rotates through. Select so person there. Um, I need more information. I've asked this before, and so uh, basically, I assume. But this, what's stated in this letter? To be a common, simple person. There's more money involved than you, your, your expert thing. 
But I re estimate just in training, it's twenty percent of his annual pay. That's in a different line item. Then we have vehicles and stuff. So that budget, twenty five hundred dollars, just car carries the food. So this would be. You want saying we're transparent? I don't see any transparency in this dog. What it really costs apples for apples for that. I haven't tracked that information because I've never been asked to up to the point where we had a dog. For me to track that information accurately, we're going to have to continue on with the program. Yeah, well, I that's why I asked for information on not that you weird about other departments, stuff, and I don't get it. It's a runaround. You got, with your years' experience, you, you should know you have a rough idea. You should know. I absolutely have a rough idea, but I can't quantify it right now in the moment. Right. I'm not here to defend the program. I don't believe. I'm just asking for a donation. Right. And I can't give support because I've always asked for a vision for me personally. So I see what we're getting involved in with the whole, whole dollar amount. Fair enough. And it keeps growing and growing and growing and stuff. And then we move smoke screens and mirrors in our budgets. And then the money, our check never goes dry. And that's not really transparent as they would say we are. I'm not sure where my budget has grown over the years. We've asked for 2500 across the board. Actually, it would shrink uh, because my payroll as a handler was much more expensive than Officer Morse's. So that number would actually go down. So we are shrinking. But it's not really transparent, though. That's all I'm saying. And given enough time, I can track that information for you. I don't have it to give you because right now I haven't worked a dog in a year. Select person man trick. Just out of curiosity, how much longer... How much more training and how long would that take and what would it Again, tough question to answer. Uh, the learning curve of the handler is always slower than the learning curve of the dog. Um, was I trained October? We're going to slow down from a tracking perspective because um, we're going to get snow here relatively quickly. I can get formative tracking training in. We can get them along. Problem is continuing tracking training in the snow because the dogs learn to sight track instead of stent track, and we don't like that. Um, spring certification, I would hope. I would hope for a spring certification, um, but I wouldn't promise it on the record. This is a frame of reference. Select person Bailey. Thank you. Uh, uh, on average, what do you think the uh, hours are necessary from the handle to make this work? Up front, um, in this level of training, the Eight-ish hours on Monday are a definite. He needs to go. He needs that hands-on. He needs that. He needs somebody other than me to work with. Um, he's lucky he has me to rely on the rest of the week. Most people don't have that. Um, Officer Morse, I can say from the prior failed experience, put more time into that dog than I ever did. He's a better, better intro handler than I ever was. Uh, but that was all during the process of being on shift, breaking down, doing a set of articles, doing a practice track. So he was doing it while he was here responding to calls, which is what most of our training actually is. We're not breaking it out. We're not dedicated to one specific thing. It's 10 minutes here, five minutes here, a quick obedience routine there. And then Mondays is the, okay, this is where you've come. This is your homework. This is what you need to accomplish. So am I losing Officer Morris for eight hours on Mondays? Certainly am. Is it worth it? Certainly is. Thank you for the information. So, um Question I have, with the eight hours that we lose, do we continue to pick that up with overtime? No, uh, and there's the benefit because the training is Monday day shift. I'm here Mondays, we have another day shift unit. I've actually built Officer Morse's schedule to be a hybrid, if you will. Um, it's a two to two schedule currently, which allows him to work his Sunday night schedule, perhaps go home a little bit early rather than 2 a.m., maybe midnight, train on Monday, work his shift Monday night. Um, so no, we don't, it doesn't impact coverage that much at all. And it's not an overtime situation at all. So is that a, like a double on Monday then if he's training? It's going to, it's going to be a longer than normal, but not quite a double. Um, I won't allow anybody, what, except in cases of emergencies right. to work more than 18. He won't go over that. Um, training generally starts about eight o'clock. He's going to roll into training late. It is what it is. They'll get over it. Um, so every Monday will be roughly what, like six hours overtime. No, probably not because it's going to be built into his schedule, so it flexes. Okay. It's not going to be OT. Mr. Chair, good luck. Um, in sharing that um, his regret not being able to be here, Vice Chair Sakosha um, wanted me to share that uh, he supports the request to accept the donation. Yep. He doesn't get a vote, but one that should support. Thank you. Yep. I plan on oh, okay. communicating that as well. My apologies for preempting. Mm -hmm. Select person mantra. Uh, anything else I move be accepted? Donation. Second vote. Roll call vote. 
Yeah, no one. Everybody can fly to me. Interesting. Hey, Leo. Yeah, bye. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I didn't want to bring it up beforehand because I didn't want to rely on emotions. Tonight, there's literally a 14-year-old boy missing just over our timeline. It would have been real nice to have a dog available for that. I'm assuming we've called in Dover. No, it's not our, it's not our kid. Um, so I didn't call in anybody because it's not my tip to make. But certainly if we'd have had a canine, my guess is we'd have got that call. Do you think there's a canine on site? I don't know. I, I don't know. It's not our jurisdiction. So I know the drones are up. I don't know anything beyond that. So would you assume that they would have a dog if they get the drones up? I would hope so. Thank you very much for a nice political answer. I, I would have. <laughs> <laughs> Select person there. Um, is it Rochester? It is not. Because um, I saw it Rochester earlier and they've been active in BAM today. I thought I'm in Pazin. The Rochester is active in BAM today. I saw the blues and I see him drive around Reno Road. So, next item on the. Um, Agenda under new business is the National Collaborative for Digital Equity and Broadband Partners. This came before the Technology Committee at the last meeting um, on this past Tuesday. Has everyone had a chance to look at the information in the packet? Would you like Connor to give kind of a brief overview on it? Um, there's roughly a cost of about $7,500 to investigate. Um, doing the necessary framework to bring to prepare for broadband in the community and to set us up to where we could pursue um, grant opportunities for, uh, to be fiber ready. Anything that I missed in that? Or? Couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, you couldn't. But. <laughs> no, I, I think that's a good idea because I've uh, received three phone calls, not pertaining to this, pertaining to the way the services and if I'm not mistaken, please correct me, but this would turn around and help us with better service to uh, individuals. It doesn't actually help us with better service to individuals at this time. What it does is it sets us up to pursue grant opportunities to look at whether we wanted to be a service provider or if we wanted to partner with somebody as a service provider. Yeah, so just to elaborate on that point briefly, because I think it's important for the community as well. So. The tough part is uh, it's tough to have competition from the in the data world um, for street data, you know, coming from power lines to, to the house because there's a lot of infrastructure cost. And so what that means is Barrington does have a couple of providers. Atlantic Broadband is the primary. First Light is most places throughout town. Uh, we also have some areas that are served by consolidated. Uh, but the problem is that that infrastructure is a tremendous investment, and to upgrade all of that infrastructure to broadband is a huge cost and quite frankly left to their own devices providers in a in a region like Barrington wouldn't take that investment and so what becoming broadband ready means is positioning the town where we do some of the legwork we do some of the researching speeds and access from different areas and that's all critical information that's necessary to secure low cost or no cost borrowing or grants or other funding sources in order to implement broadband. Now, it could be that once we become broadband ready, the town says, hands over the, the kind of work that we've done, the prep work that we've done to the private sector and said, here it is, it's, it's public information. You can use this to try to secure grants or low cost um, interest rates or anything else. It's also possible, which some communities do, is to do a public-private partnership where they say, hey, the community says, we still want some control over where fiber is gonna be, how it's going to get there, what the service level is going to be for residents. And so we'll actually make the investment in the infrastructure, but you manage it for us. And so we'll own it, we'll lease it to you, you manage it, and we will maintain some control that way. There's other communities, and you see this a lot of times in Massachusetts, um, and, and I, not as much in New Hampshire, and probably for good reason, based on the values of, of New Hampshire residents, but you'll see municipalities that own and operate the entire into the entire um, network access, cable and internet. Um, and so that's a model that's possible also. As uh, Chair Nat mentioned, we're very far from that decision making, years away from that decision making. Uh, but what we should do now, and, and what I'm asking for the technology committee supports, is to position ourselves well now, use some funds from the ARPA um, uh, funding source through the uh, 
federal appropriation in order to become fiber ready. So as those funding sources continue to become available, low cost grants and loans and everything, um, we can be in a position to take advantage of them and not be caught chasing our tail trying to catch up um, when when the stuff comes. So, hope that answer. Thank you very much. It really does. Thank you. See, Thank I told you, you'd say it better. Well, you know. <laughs> I just wasn't positive we have to get into the weeds like that, oh. but I think it is important for the residents. <coughs> I agree. So I'll make a motion. I got a motion. Oops. Go ahead, select person there. So my understanding, there is five offers. That's <clears throat> up 125, four, and nine. Those help us. They're supposed to be able to tap into it. right now. It's for everything. It was done probably eight years, ten years ago. So will this help us? People that have access to that get into it. So maybe, um, so the, the main throughways having fiber is something that is a, uh, the money is in it for the providers to run fiber on 9 and 125 because you have the demand and you have the density. So, uh, you know, not to pick on some of the businesses in town, but you've got TurboCam on 9 and 125 and they need fiber to be a successful business. And so they're willing to pay what it takes right. to have that fiber service other businesses um, as well, and the schools also. And so the um, what isn't in the financial best interest typically from an investment standpoint of a service provider is to do that last mile. So to spread off into the neighborhoods, go up Village Place, come down yep. to Hill Road, all the rest. And so if they're not going to do it on their own, but we want to have that for our residents, then we should make some investments now to do some of the design, mapping, engineering, um, to figure out what the cost is, see if we're eligible for some of these grants or low cost, uh, low interest loans, and um, try to develop a partnership, maybe with one of the providers that's already here, maybe with a different provider. So, uh, yes, the fiber there would help us, uh, but that's not, uh, we, you know, my personal opinion is let the free market do what it's going to do. Right. And if it's going to bring fiber to those places, perfect. We don't need to worry about that. But it's bringing the fiber of the places that it isn't and where the free market won't bring it. All right. Thank you. So at that this time, I'll make a motion to um, expend up to $7,500 from Barrington's ARPA funds to partner with uh, the National Collaborative for Digital Equity on preparing for broadband for Second. Barrington. Aye. 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 Thank you. Keep you updated on that process. Select board reports. I'm ready. Go. Are you ready? I'm glad you sit down. Um, first of all, town lands. I didn't make the meeting, but it was over Daria Drive and stuff. And then there was a lot of mixed um, ideas from the board and stuff. So I feel. Information I gather, so they might come to the select board and ask them for more of a direction, which of what we would want them to focus on. Um, it's a can of where for them over there. It's a bunch of ideas. They're still doing their homework, but they might ask for advice. That's a feeling I got. Um, and then conservation, we had a good meeting and everything, and then. Um, uh, I disclosed earlier, we had a conversation on uh, on that. And then there's a um, the recommendation of the conservation. There's a subdivision going over in Meadowbrook, and it's the open space. Conservation wasn't interested in taking it over and stuff, so they, they designed it. They took the consideration, so it's part of the lot. It was kind of like Deer Ridge. So the homeowner station at Lano is a responsible deed restrictions. So it won't be coming in front of the town to take it over. So they were happy and stuff that people came, they they gave a suggestion and they followed it. So that's about it. So like person man trick. Oh, thank you. Uh, you have the notes, uh, you have the minutes of the uh, budget committee met last week to meet again next Tuesday. Tomorrow. Or tomorrow, yes, whatever the next Tuesday is. <laughs> that thing tomorrow. Uh, the school board uh, had a a very uh, acrimonious uh, debate on, on masks. Um, I think we were involved at some point, uh, and the decision was made to extend the mask mandate for another two weeks. 
uh, to be revised, be reviewed at the next meeting based on the uh, criteria that they've, they've set up, which I think is pretty comprehensive. Uh, the uh, transfer uh, station committee uh, meeting was canceled. It's scheduled, I think, for two weeks. We'll know more details. So, person Bailey. Thank you very much. The uh, I did not attend the uh, library meeting, which I intend to do uh, the next one coming up. Uh, the next on top of that was a ZBA meeting. There were uh, four cases to come before the ZBA. Uh, the last three were approved without any difficulty. Yeah, when one of them was uh, continued uh, for uh, lack of uh, total information necessary for the board to uh, help in their decision. And that has been rescheduled to the next meeting. I do have a personal comment, not to do with the uh, ZBA, but I want to thank the police for uh, their uh, uh, attention to detail when we had that meeting. I think that uh, their uh, presence did uh, quell some fears that other people had. So again, I'd like to thank them personally for being here. and. Uh, we we'll look forward to the next meeting. <clears throat> the technology committee um, met last Tuesday or Tuesday before now. Tuesday before last, which uh, is where we discussed the national collaborative word digital equity um, component and a couple other kind of miscellaneous items. I don't think anything that would get anyone too excited around this table, except for maybe Connor. That's pretty low threshold. Yeah. yeah. Um, planning board met last Tuesday, and the conversation was mostly around zoning changes. Uh, what's what they're looking at? What's coming forward? The discussion around Steve Diamond, which we voted on earlier. So, uh, we're targeting the next meeting to have some suggested uh, zoning amendments to be brought forward, and any language changes that folks want to have discussed. That was uh, the extent of that. And importantly, there the planning board does intend to provide uh, to bring forward a few zoning amendments um, for town meeting this year. Um, and so for anybody that's interested in that topic or following along, um, the second meeting in October is when they'll be discussing it again, um, which would be October two weeks after uh, 19th, probably. That's a Tuesday. Yeah, the October 19th meeting. Um, the board will be discussing in detail um, any specific zoning adjustments they'd like to propose. Um, and so if you have a vested interest, um, that'd be a good one to attend and offer your comments and public comment. Um, the, any zoning change uh, would also have public hearings, um, so there'd be specific information published um, and you could attend and review that. Would the information be available prior to that meeting? Do they, do they have that published so we can review it? No, it's a work session. OK, um, thank you. So, yeah. so it's early on in the process, but I think a lot of times what we hear at the town hall from residents is they find out about things too late um, when it's too far along in the process. So I just wanted to emphasize that this is the this is the early part of the process for the zoning changes. Uh, there's still time and things are getting crafted. I'll tell you the planning board meeting last Tuesday the discussion was long and lively because I don't think we got out of there till 10 o'clock or later. So. Any other items that I've missed from boards, committees, things like that? Nope. Um, final public comment. Just the camera. No, no, not mine. Just camera, right? Yeah, that don't mic. touch the <laughs> mic. <laughs> then we get the reverb. Uh, I'm going to be real short. I just wanted to update the board and the, the public as far as the hiring process goes. I didn't want to jump the gun and spoil something. Uh, we gave a conditional offer last week to a young man named Cameron Barry. He sent us an email today saying he accepted it. He was going to come in hopefully this week sometime with the sworn to paperwork. Uh, young Mr. Barry recently separated from the Marine Corps, going to be living in Epping. So good, solid pickup. Obviously, he's going to be a while before he's on the street. We need to get him hired and get him through the academy in January. But it's a good hire. Uh, Sergeant's process is in the midst as we speak. Did the written test last week. Um, all three individuals who took it did very, very well. I was very proud of all three involved. 
and we're moving on to oral boards this Wednesday. Uh, we have a group of supervisors from Epping, Durham, and yeah. Yep, Epping, Durham, and Dover. Thank you. Um, Chris, Chris Plummer is going to make a return trip to Barrington for me to help me out. So um, thank you for your supporting all those and moving right along and hopefully we'll be caught up here pretty quick. Thank you. I think that's back off. Uh, if there's anybody that wants to offer a public comment virtually, you can raise your hand and enter a comment in the chat box, or if you're on your phone, you can press star six to uh, unmute yourself, speak up, and wait to be recognized by the chair. Yeah, at that time, I don't see anything coming through online. We'll give it 10 more seconds. There. All right. This time I'll close public comment. <clears throat> yes. Do we have anything for non public this evening? No, sir. Oh, I know. Um, at that time, then I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Roll call vote. Air I. Metric I. Fairly high. Nap I. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. I always I go stop.